So I think we'll, uh, we'll start. It's now quarter past ten. And as ever, we have a lot to get through. So um, today we're going to continue with our contextualization of the course. Uh, get, as remember, yesterday we finished entering into the sort of year of 1900. We again had our sort of two peasant characters, um, Ivan and Anastasia, who we were following. Um, just to briefly recap then, so we saw what the life for most Russians was like in the year 1800. It was a society dominated by many dangers, by a great deal of poverty, predominantly an agrarian society, predominantly a stable society, an illiterate society. Um, one typically where the place you were born in was going to be the place where you died. A society where there wasn't much in the way of either the presence of the state or of medical assistance beyond folk healers in the village. We noted the expansion of the Russian Empire eastwards in the previous centuries into Siberia, into the former Muslim states of Kazan and Astrakhan. We noted its expansion westwards into the Baltic, into Poland, into Romania, and down into the Caucasus, well, southwards, into the Caucasus and Crimea. Then we began talking about the changes that would occur in 1900. And already we saw that it was, in many ways, the, the, village, uh, the rural village life still remained the same. There was still a great deal of uncertainty, instability, and danger. Lack of food presented an ever-present threat, causing a famine. As you remember, I'll go to the slide now, in, 80, in 1891, 1892, killing as many as half a million people in the central provinces of Russia. Medicine had been revolutionized by new developments, such as the germ theory of disease developed by the French uh, Dr. Louis Pasteur in the 1850s. But still, access to medical professionals was rather limited, especially in the villages. That meant that many peasants, like our two characters, still in cases of illness or accident, had to rely on the old-fashioned methods, turning to folk healers and their knowledge of local plants and folk remedies. They might still turn to the church and its offerings of holy miraculous cures through various holy items. And we noted, however, that although on the surface level things might not have changed, there was a profound change in the empire's social order in 1861 with the abolition of serfdom. Now, as you remember, we discussed serfdom dominated rural society, um, essentially making the overwhelming population of Russian, uh, Russian peasants very close to something like slaves in the hands of noble landowners. In 1861, with the abolition of serfdom, this slavery was essentially ended. Now, it's worth keeping in mind, again, to have a comparative example. Of course, serfdom had been more or less ending across Central and Eastern Europe from about 1800 onwards. But still, this was still four years before the United States abolished slavery for its African-American uh, inhabitants. And we noted that this abolition of serfdom uh, contained within its problems, mainly the problems of redistributing the land to the newly free peasants. The peasants had to pay the state for the lands that it gave them. 
at extremely at quite at above market prices for a period that was predicted to last over half a century. The nobles controlled redistribution processes, and the peasants were not integrated into the uh, universal society that Alexander II's great reforms were trying to create. They remained very much a second-class citizenry, subordinated not to courts, the bureaucracy, but to the peasant commune. That institution dominated by the peasants themselves, which managed their relationship with, between the rest of society and the state. And I think we ended, um, we discussed the phenomena of population growth following the abolition of serfdom. And I want to emphasize, I don't think I emphasized enough here yesterday, this was a truly massive population growth. Russia's peasant population doubles within the space of about 40 years. And the problem is, as we discussed yesterday, there's very little land, especially productive land, in Russia. And this um, enormous growth of population, combined with lack of land, combined with nobles still holding estates, uh, creates a phenomenon known as land hunger, and an increasing resentment by the peasants at the nobility's land holdings. But there are other reactions as well. We noted migration. And again, I want to emphasize, perhaps I did not yesterday. Did we go forward? No, we did not go forward. Peasant migration. Um, and I want to emphasize again how much of a change this is. We discussed yesterday, uh, in 1800, how rare it was for you to know a world beyond your village the near, uh, and its near, uh, nearby locations. People, generally speaking, people died in the place they were born, or very close by to the place they were born. Now suddenly, with the peasants being freed by uh, the abolition of serfdom, no longer requiring permission from landlords to move, and being driven by land hunger, by the need to provide uh, additional sources of funding of, uh, for themselves, they start to migrate. Russia's empire is increasingly an empire on the move, an empire of mobility. This has two consequences, additionally in the village. Firstly, it becomes a monetized economy. Cash, for the first time, starts flowing into the villages. No longer, um, and starts to establish market relations. No longer are people dominant, uh, reliant on trading in kind, so you trade eggs, eggs for something that you need, etc., etc. Now people are starting to pay for things, and the state is able to exploit these new forms of cash with new taxes and, more importantly, most importantly, new taxation systems. Increasingly, that means the state is increasingly becoming a, a part of the village world, and as peasant men migrate to the cities to earn money. They leave behind their wives, who start to assume male roles in the community and in the household, while the husband or father is absent. Now, that doesn't mean a change in legal status of women, but a simply um, women are still regarded very much, as we're going to discuss later today, as second-class citizens, legally speaking. But they are starting to assume this role um, assume um, a greater degree of social prominence in the village. Now, I think this is where we ended like yesterday, so I'm just going to make uh, one thing clear, is today I'm going to actually spend the entire lecture doing the 1900 contextualization, okay? So next, uh, next lecture will be about Peter the Great. We'll go backwards in time and do Peter the Great's church reforms. I think it's a good idea to do these two lectures to give you the full contextual picture it's very important background for all the rest of the course. Um, and the two lectures, the two next lectures go very well together, Peter the Great's reforms and then church-state relations. Okay, so today we're going to focus on precisely this changing Russia around the year 1900, okay? Um,
And by the way, I just also want to mention is, if you, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you yesterday and today. If you don't remember it all or don't understand it, don't worry, because we're going to repeat it a lot throughout the, throughout the rest of the course in the context of religion, all right? And of course, you can always go to the Moodle, download the slides and take another look. And I'm also, if you have time, I'm sure in Estonian there are some sort of very good general introductions to Russian history. If you have a few moments, you can have a look through, okay? Or in English, of course. Well, another consequence of increased mobility is migration to Siberia. We discussed yesterday how the state had used Siberia basically as a dumping ground for its criminal elements whom it then expected to become good settlers somehow, despite being physically destroyed by a thousand miles of trek, of walking from central Russia into Siberia, despite the fact that many of them came from criminal backgrounds and were convicted criminals. Now, these land, now, now we have land hunger, and many peasants are voluntarily going to Siberia. The state encourages them, of course. It wants to settle this huge, almost empty expanse of land that it has at its disposal. And it wants peasants to take, uh, and it sponsors peasants to go into Siberia. And as a consequence, the, Siberia, the population of Siberia increases dramatically in the late, in late Imperial Russia. I've given you the figure here. In the space of 20 years, the population of Siberia almost doubles. And it's not, Siberia is no longer simply a place of criminals, exiles, um, peasants, uh, serfs who've run away, the native populations. Increasingly, it becomes a Russian dominated, uh, a Russian peasant dominated society. Establishing new cities, like today, um, what is today Novosibirsk, the third biggest city in Russia, was founded in this period precisely by incoming settlers, settler populations. But, okay, we've talked about some factors that are driving migration. The abolition of serfdom, land hunger, the policies of the state to settle Siberia. But what enables all this? What revolution allows all of these peasants, all of these people moving to cities, moving to Siberia? Well, it is possibly the greatest technological innovation of the 19th century, the railways. We talked yesterday in 1800, transportation networks were extremely limited in Russia. The road system, such as it can be called a road system, was basically a set of mud tracks. Rivers were useful when there were rivers, but otherwise moving around was difficult it was time consuming. Do you remember we saw that it, it was a shorter trip around from St. Petersburg to go around, Af to sail around Africa to east to Far East and Siberia than to walk across Siberia. But with the construction of train lines in Russia from the 1830s onwards, moving suddenly become across the vast distances of the Russian Empire suddenly becomes much easier, much more accessible. And this is partially done, and partially the fact, uh, one reason is, um, the tickets are cheap. You can get a third class ticket for relatively little money. Peasants are able to afford, to a considerable extent, these train tickets. The state sponsors train tickets, especially for peasants migrating to Siberia. We see in 1903, 93.5 million third class tickets are sold in that year on the railways. And to precisely to sponsor this new migration, the state undertakes one of the great engineering projects of the age, the Trans-Siberian Railway. It takes more than two decades to build. It truly is, when you read the account of how this thing was built, it truly is a marvel, cutting through mountains. Um, draining swamps, cutting down acres and acres of forest in uh, the deep Siberian taiga, the uh, forest land, the frozen forest lands of Siberia. 
going from Moscow, St. Petersburg and Moscow, all the way to Vladivostok on the Pacific Ocean. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to um, overstate just how, just how uh, big a transformation the railway brings, not just to Russia, not just to Europe, but to the world in general. The world is becoming a smaller place. People are being able to move around, visit new places, see new things, get a better grasp of geography, of the countries they live in. We're going to discuss the new middle classes in Russia and in Europe are able to afford for the first time something I'm sure we've all engaged in, tourism. Tourism, mass tourism, starts to truly become a thing in the late 19th, in late 19th century. You start to you have resort towns opening in, Russia, in the Russian Empire. A very popular one, there were several very popular ones in the Baltic. Um, in, uh, um, I'm going, to, I'm going to terribly mispronounce this name. In Russian, it's Ustnarov. Uh, today, it's Narva Yossi. Yossi? Um, north of Narva. It's an Estonian town. Yue, yue, yue. Yes, yes. So I, I, beg, I beg your pardon. Um, I'm going to mangle every Estonian word I try and say. I'm terribly sorry in advance. Um, but yeah, that was, at the time, that became an extraordinarily popular. An extraordinarily popular tourist destination site for the middle classes in St. Petersburg. And they came precisely on trains and on steam-powered ferries. The world is opening not just in terms of transport and movement, however. Education is beginning to flourish. Now, literacy levels are still staggeringly low in the Russian Empire. 21% of the population is literate. And most of the people who are literate are still peasants. But this is a rather marked development compared to a century earlier, in 1800. It is now the case, for instance, our two peasant heroes, Ivan and Anastasia, are literate. They can read and write. Because in their, in their village now, has opened a, school, uh, a church parish school, where the priest and a paid assistant teach literacy. And the church played a huge role in the development of primary education in the uh, Russian Empire. In 1900, most of the primary schools available in the Russian Empire were, uh, especially, in the, especially in the villages, were church parish schools. This network had been developed um, almost from nothing in the uh, 1880 into a network spanning, I think, about 25,000 schools by about 1910. And with the development of literacy, peasants are starting to develop new tastes, tastes in reading. Of course, many of them use their new skills to turn to the church, uh, to church texts. The church itself starts printing pamphlets, materials, texts designed for peasant readers, written in a simple, earthy language meant to inspire and capture the imagination of peasants and hopefully increase their devotion. But from the cities, a new literature is emerging, a new popular literature. And thus, new ideas are starting to leak into the countryside. Ideas, by the way, which some of which are not particularly um, liked by the central state. I'll just quickly go on to the next slide. So, the, typically, the most traditional form of Russian, of Russian peasant reading was Vlubok, basically a very cheap, easily mass-produced form of uh, fairy tale storytelling. We have in the background here an example. I think it's from the 18th century, if I remember rightly. Um, but with literacy, as I mentioned, an interest in other kinds of books starts to emerge. And these books are increasingly sponsored by the, uh, the uh, libraries, for instance, in the villages are sponsored by both the state and church. And they generally try to have a range of readings available. Of course, what, we, what books are suitable is determined by the state, uh, the priest, various other social actors, and of course, what they generally want to avoid, they want what they call uh, spiritually edifying literature. But of course, 
Um, trashy, trashy fiction starts to pour in. Um, Sherlock Holmes becomes immensely popular in Russia in, uh, around 1900. Hugely popular, even among peasant readers. These kind of, uh, and other such detective stories, romances, etc., etc. So then, let's return to our sort of our character, Ivan. So Ivan has, he's part of a large family, and just like everybody else in his village, he needs to, he, there is not enough land now for him to support his family, his growing family, with his wife and his young child. And so he has to engage in migration, go to the cities in the winter when he's not required to work his family's land. And Ivan, deci Ivan decides to follow the other man in his village and go to the imperial capital, St. Petersburg, home to certainly now one of the most industrialized cities in the empire, alongside Moscow, Warsaw, Lvov, and Riga. St. Petersburg center, of course, looks as it did in 1800 and looks as it, did, as it does today, mostly. An imposing uh, neoclassical facade um, filled with magnificent churches, imperial palaces, noble pleasure houses. But on the outskirts are emerging one of the telltale signs of industrial modernity, slums, where cheap housing is given to the new working class population. Cheap housing uh, with people packed to rooms full of diseases, crime, dirt, and many other, and many other problems. And of course, again, now Ivan is more, this Ivan is more worldly than his 1800 ancestor. He's been to school, he can read. He's seen a map of the world, for instance, in his school. He can conceptualize other spaces. He can read about other experiences. But still coming from his village in Nizhny Novgorod to St. Petersburg in 1900 is still a cultural shock. Because St. Petersburg is on the cutting edge of Russian industrial modernity. He will see, for instance, the developing tram lines being built to ferry around St. Petersburg's ever-increasing population with greater ease and comforts than ever before. You will see things like bicycles, a relatively new, a relatively new invention of the, late, of the late 19th century, increasingly being used by the middle classes, not just as a mode of transport, but as a, mode of le uh, as a leisure activity. He might even occasionally see some cars on the street. The cityscape is changing. No longer are the roads purely the, uh, the uh, terrain of horses, carriages, and people, but of mechanized modes of transportation. He might, if he was very lucky, look up one day and see the first plane flights, Russian plane flights. They were, I think, I think it was about sort of a, uh, so this is the first uh, school of aviation established in Russia, in Sevastopol, for some reason. But there was, a school, there was an airfield in St. Petersburg by the beginning of the First World War in 1914. And what was driving all this? Well, it was industrialization. The Industrial Revolution, which began in Britain in the 18th century, had now spread across Europe and was increasingly gaining purchase in Russia as well. Factories had already begun to pit modern, truly modern industrial factories had begun to appear in the 1860s. And their expansion was fueled by the uh, emancipation of the serfs and their migratory patterns seeking extra work. But the true expansion begins in the 1890s, following the financial reforms of the minister, an important person in the narrative of late imperial Russia, Sergei von Witter, Russia becomes, really starts to shoot up the league tables in production, becoming the third or fourth 
produce, world producer of, go, of, important, of the goods driving Europe's industrial development. Coal, iron, iron in particular, the steel. And we start to see the phenomenon of mega factories. Oh, oh, there we are. The Putilov factory in St. Petersburg producing an enormous array of goods, particularly patronized by the state because they produced weapons, the modern weapons of 20th century warfare, artillery, machine guns. But they also produced the very things driving the transport revolution, railway engines, railway lines. Now, this one factory alone, 12,000 people in 1900, a truly enormous a complex in St. Petersburg. But it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't the biggest in Europe, in fact, or the biggest in the Russian Empire. In fact, the, one, the biggest in the Russian Empire and one of the biggest in, the, um, in Europe was located in Narva on the Isle of uh, Krynholm, or Krengholm in Russian. Uh, that was set up in the 1860s by the German uh, textile magnate Alfred Knopp. I don't know if any of you have been to Narva or seen this, where this factory used to be. Um, but truly, they were, they, that factory hired over 50,000 people in its height to produce uh, textile, uh, textile products, clothing, etc., etc. And what is emerging then is precisely a new working class, a proletariat, to use the Marxist term. And just like elsewhere in Europe, I'm sure if you're familiar with works of people like Charles, uh, Charles Dickens, etc., you know of a sort of the sort of the squalor produced by the Industrial Revolution and by mass factory work. Um, hours were long, between anywhere between 12, uh, 10 to 12 hours a day. Accidents with the machinery extremely frequent. Pay very low. Young uh, ch uh, children as young as 15 employed, some even younger. They weren't particularly thorough in checking. And even deaths and high levels of fatalities in, these, in this new mechanized form of production. Oh, I beg your pardon. No, I don't think so. And of course, where are these um, new workers being housed? Well, precisely in the slums. Well, the Russian First thing we should mention is the Russian cities are, comparatively speaking, finally growing um, to the point of being metropolises, especially with Petersburg and Moscow. They're now two of the biggest cities in Europe, in fact. The proportion of the people living in the cities is increasing. But for many of these newcomers, there was very little in the way of good, safe, sanitised housing. Instead, cheap tenement blocks were rapidly constructed with little regard to comfort, hygiene, or other concerns. I'm sure if some of you have read, some of you here have read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which takes place directly in the Haymarket, which he, uh, one of the slums in St. Petersburg, already emerging in 1860s, which he depicts as a dreadful den of prostitution, uh, drunkenness, drunkenness, disease and illness, and desperation. If you're interested in sort of looking at some other accounts, you can, buy, you can find Alexander Kuprin's novel in English uh, called the, the Pit, Yama. Um, also a depiction of a St. Petersburg slum. Or you can find the journalist, uh, the Moscow journalist Giliarovsky, Gilyar who writes about the slums in Moscow in the early 1900s and the, and the world of underground crime in the slums. And certainly they were dens of, of petty and organized crime. <laughs> 
Now we can transfer to a slightly happier topic as a consequence of the great reforms. We have this notion, this idea, this uh, new phenomenon, civil society. So Alexander II, when he brings in his great reforms, of which the abolition of serfdom was by far the most important, he creates other conditions for the emergence of new social activities. For the first time, a trial-based legal system is established. Previously in Russia, trials had been uh, basically, uh, there had been no jury, no ab uh, advocates or defense, simply usually a, uh, a judge who would hear the evidence and then deliver a verdict. Now you start to have court a court system created. Of course, the peasants, as I mentioned before, generally were not tried in courts, but by the peasant communes, as before. They were excluded from this sort of new system. Um, and of course, and with the emergence of law courts, you have new professions of lawyer, uh, professional lawyers, for instance. And another, pro and another thing was the change to the censorship law. Russia had had, especially under Nicholas I, between 1825 and 1855, 1855, had had an extremely strict censorship regime. Alexander loosens it, and suddenly there is now a flood of words, a new sphere of discussion between educate, in educated society, people exchanging opinions on reform, on what Russia needs to do, on, on every other kind of social question, social, economic, political, cultural question. You have the flourishing with the uh, reduction in censorship or the changes in censorship rules, the flourishing of newspapers, journals, book publication. And of course, this is going very well when you, have, when you look at the development of literacy, because there is an inc increasingly large market of people clamoring for these new works. It, start, it becomes in Russia for the first time possible to be a, uh, a writer a journalist um, independently to survive on the sales of your work. And this is what we call, what sociologists, historians like to call civil society. This emergence of groups and organizations who are serving um, not the, neither the state, um, not the state, nor necessarily uh, businesses, but rather creating a space of discussion um, of social problems and social and political issues. And what is allowing, the, uh, along with the trains, of course, there is a communications revolution going on. The telegraph is invented and established for the first station established in 1852. Within two decades, a network is already spread across the Russian Empire, allowing near instantaneous communication. No longer is one dependent on a horse-driven postal network. Also the telephone at the beginning of the 20th century, although to a, limited, uh, to a much more limited extent than elsewhere in Europe, is allowing the exchange of communications and ideas and, uh, and um, business over a vast, over a vast space in ever, in, uh, in ever shortening amounts of time. And we have the emergence of the new middle classes. The people who are being the lawyers who are serving the new law courts, the journalists writing in the new newspapers, the teachers in the new schools, the doctors being trained in the new most modern methods of medicine, the university lecturers serving in some of Russia's newly established universities, engineers servicing the railways, taking peasants to the factories and to Siberia. And this creation 
of a new middle class society. Uh, this new middle class society has some new things. It has something called disposable income. So after all of their expenses are covered, they have money left over. And they have regular working hours, you know, not so different from how, what we have today, you know, 10 to 10 to 6 or 9 to 5 or whatever. And they're using this disposable income and this new concept of free time in ever, increasing, in ever different and increasingly vibrant ways, contributing to charity, an older form, establishing clubs. So what did the new, new middle classes in Russia, how do they want to spend their free time and their new disposable incomes? Well, a variety of options are emerging. If you are a sport, uh, a fan of sports, new clubs are being established. New sporting clubs, athletic clubs were extremely popular. Football was, spre uh, football, um, was spreading um, and increasingly popular. Driven by these um, the new availability of free time, the ability to spend time on doing something other than simply surviving or working. Are people cold, by the way? I mean, uh, um, perhaps, yes. Perhaps people would like to go shopping. The Russian Empire, uh, the, the, the cities of the Russian Empire were increasingly um, becoming dominated by new modern shops, not the old trading stalls that had dominated the city, uh, cities, but modern department stalls, offering a new, rational, polite, cultured exchange between customer and client. Here, this is the uh, Scottish company, Mir Amirilis in Moscow. Uh, this is on Red Square, and the, this building is still here today. Um, after the in the revolution, it was turned into uh, Gum, that's the state general store, and today it's Sum, the central general store. But if you go to Red Square, this is opposite the Kremlin. It's one of the most magnificent sort of examples of department stores. But this was only just one in St. Petersburg. Um, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, they established a very similar, although less grand, uh, shopping center in the center. In other cities as well, places like uh, you start to see catering to middle class uh, abilities to spend money and their desire to do so in places which are clean, well lit, architecturally magnificent. You might choose to go. you might choose to go to the cinema. Cinema coming from Paris, the Lumiere brothers, the beginning of the 1890s, spreads rapidly in Russia, as it does elsewhere. And even, there is even a domestic industry by the beginning of the First World War producing Russian films for Russian audiences. And again, one can talk about this in the expansion of worldviews, sort of being able to see these moving images on a screen for the first time, being, uh, gaining access to a new world through them. Well, of course, um, habits never go out of fashion. Uh, alcohol remains just as it was in the village uh, rem alcohol remains an important pastime, um, a social activity, a way of relieving tedium or boredom, a way of numbing pain, um, still extremely popular. And I think I told you yesterday, perhaps I'm kind of from the stereotype about Russians being big drinkers, certainly the imperial government itself believed this stereotype. But actually, when statistics were collected at the end of the 19th century, Russia was about the middle of the league tables. French drank, drank on average more than the Russians, as did Norwegians and other Scandinavian countries. The Russians, at least from the statistics gathered, did not uh, overindulge 
as popular stereotypes had it. But one interesting difference in Russia is that in 1897, the state actually establishes a monopoly on vodka sales, on the vodka trail as a whole. So all vodka production, from the creating of the liquid itself, to the making of the glass bottles, to the corks, to the, to the sales of vodka, to the uh, buildings in which those sales took place, all became a state enterprise. It was a state monopoly. One reason the state did this is because it thought that they could, in, uh, we, by this, wield an influence on the drinking habits of Russians. Um, the actual more practical reason was it was hugely profitable. In fact, by 1914, uh, one third of the Russian state's income was generated by the vodka trade. The reason, one, particular re one, one of the reasons the war doesn't go well for Russia is because it, immediately after the war is declared in August 1914, the, uh, Nicholas declares prohibition, which takes away a huge amount of money from the state from the sale of vodka. But of course, I mean, and of course, these sort of establishments where drinking can take place are rapidly changing as well to reflect uh, new tastes. You start to have the first the emergence of sort of uh, middle-class restaurants where you can eat a nice meal along with your drink. Of course, and in the uh, working class areas, one finds drinking dens, sort of places where one can obtain principally vodka, and also of course beer and wine, um, relatively cheaply. And of course, these businesses are these, clactili, uh, these taverns, are often linked to other forms of social vice, such as prostitution and crime. So as I mentioned, we have the cinemas, we have new, new, uh, large newspapers, um, new intellectual classes promoting new ideas. And many of these ideas were fundamentally challenging. Views on the world, views on society, views on the state that had been traditionally pushed by the, uh, by the state itself and by the state's assistance, the Russian Orthodox Church. It's stunning to think that this is the period only sort of uh, five years, only in 1905. Einstein publishes his theorem of special relativity, uh, dramatically changing the way in which we conceive of the universe. Now, of course, the theories of Einstein were not widely propagated in Russia, and particularly among most Russians, um, because largely the theories of Einstein didn't become truly understood until many decades later. But there are uh, other ideas. Um, perhaps we'll go back to that. Well, actually, we'll just work forward. Um, Charles Darwin, of course, the great nat the British naturalist, the uh, who at first truly elaborated a scientific conception of evolution of man's, an or a man's on animal origins. Rapidly translated into Russian, the first one comes out in 1864. And what Darwin's idea does is precisely challenge the old biblical narratives about man being a creation of God. And that challenges conception, the conception of man's place in the universe. Man is no longer the center of creation, but rather simply another animal without any particular special divinely appointed purpose. In social terms, we have Karl Marx. Again, extraordinarily popular in Russia, uh, in Russia, especially among radical circles. I'm not going to I'm not going to go too much into the theory, of course the social theory of uh, the theory of Marxism today. But basically, Marx argues for an evolutionary theory of society. History is the history of class conflict of social groups clashing with one another and producing new forms of social organization. And Marxist ideas pose a deliberate threat to traditional ideas of the family, of traditional ideas of rule, 
in, of imperial governments in, in Russian society. His ideas gain rapid spread through revolutionaries into working class uh, districts. And talking of revolutionaries, already in the 1820s there had been ideas about the czarist system, the system of absolute monarchy where one man, and it was in the 19th century a man, um, had absolute power over a, over a country where people did not have rights, where people did not, um, where 85% of the population were slaves before 1861. This was already making people think that this system cannot be saved. It has to be radically and violently overthrown. The first attempt was made in 1825 by the so-called Decemberists, who attempted to unseat the new Tsar Nicholas I. Now, when Alexander, of course, liberalizes the country, um, abolishing censorship, well, these new, rad uh, new radical ideas um, uh, begin to spread, um, gaining support among Russia's new intellectual, intellectual stratum, uh, social groups. Already this has a political consequence as early as the end of the 1860s, as assassination attempts by revolutionaries begin to be made against Alexander II. They finally succeeded in 1881. Uh, I'll show you, we'll just go forward to the picture. Driving along uh, the embankments in St. Petersburg, uh, going back to the Winter Palace after having met his government, um, a bomber jumped out and tried to explode the carriage of the Tsar. Well, fortunately, the Tsar had learnt from previous assassination attempts to be prepared. The carriage was armoured, so the horses were killed, uh, one of the bodyguards was killed, but the Tsar himself uh, was unharmed. But the Tsar decide, Alexander decided that he would get out of the carriage and go and shout at the dying terrorist uh, on the floor. And, that was where, and unfortunately for Alexander, the terrorists uh, the revolutionaries had also learned a lesson because they had a second bomber waiting. Uh, his legs were, uh, the, the bomb hit, his legs were blown, Alexander's legs were blown off. He was taken back to the Imperial Palace, but had already died, uh, the Winter Palace, but had already died by the time he had arrived. Um, we'll just go back, I think, just to go. We mentioned. Another new idea, of course, relates to the role, the social position, and the legal status of women in society. We mentioned already that uh, peasant women left behind by their husbands as they travel for work were assuming a greater male role in the household. But elsewhere, and I also mentioned that precisely women are still, legally speaking, second-class citizens, at least until 1905. They were essentially the uh, women were essentially the responsibility of their nearest male relative, be it their husband or father. Their, this, these male, the permission of these male relatives were required if they wanted a job, for instance, or if they were applying for a passport. Men fundamentally still controlled women's lives, but this was beginning to be questioned. In the 1850s, going on through until 1917, there was a large public debate about what the role of, a, of women should be in Russian society. Should they be limited to the home, to be caregivers to their children uh, and husbands? Or should they have a more public role in society? Should women's employment and education be encouraged? And at least initially in the 1860s, 1850s and 1860s, uh, Alexander II was very favorable to encouraging women's education and encouraging uh, women not only to become educated, but to become educators. Now, it was allowed for women to attend university lectures for the first time in the late 1850s, 1860s. 
And in the eight, late 1870s, the first courses be, create, prepared, were created to allow women to become nurses and doctors. Now, of course, you might note very quickly that what roles are being assigned to women in these new reforms? Teachers, nurses, doctors. In other words, the uh, new social roles that they're given is an extension of their, tradition, of their perceived traditional roles within the household. But women are, many women are also joining the radical socialist movements, demanding equal treatment with their male counterparts from the state. I didn't, I think, because I cut out some of the slides from yesterday, I didn't talk about sort of high culture in 1800. So I'll do so briefly. In 1800, Russian literature, for instance, um, there were certainly some Russian uh, authors of prominence, Gluboyedov, for instance, in 1800. Um, but Russian literature at that point was still largely uh, underdeveloped. Most Russian uh, sort of novels at the time, uh, plays, books being produced, were largely translations of popular Western classics. This is, of course, no longer the case by 1900. Russian high culture has a massive selection of its own homegrown authors, with, uh, authors painters, uh, composers, architects, um, so on and so forth, all of whom have become since internationally recognized names of world culture. Following the revolutionary poetry of Alexander Pushkin, Russian literature in particular rapidly established for itself an international reputation with names like Gostievsky, Tolstoy, Lermontov, Tegenev. Tegenev was, uh, was the first Russian um, to win um, the Nobel Prize in literature, if I remember rightly. I think so, yes. And of course, in music, these sort of uh, music, ballet, opera. Stra I only need to say the names Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, etc., etc. Stravinsky, in particular, um, a radical whose uh, whose uh, opera, um, the Firebird, caused a riot in the uh, early 20th century when it was shown in Paris because of its um, radically new approach to sound, to music, and to singing. So we've gone then, we followed, we've come from the lowest of the low in the Russian Empire, the peasants, and now we reach the very, we've gone through the new um, middle classes emerging, and now we go to the very heights. The emperor, Nicholas II, and of course, the last emperor of Russia. Again, we'd be forgiven for thinking that not much had changed. Russia still does not have a constitution. It has no Supreme Court. It has no Parliament. As far as Nicholas is concerned, when he uh, takes the throne in 1894, after his father dies suddenly, uh, uh, dies suddenly in the Crimea, um, he is God's chosen. He rules Russia absolutely. Just as God rules man, absolutely, so Nicholas rules Russia, absolutely. Just as man owes unlimited obedience to God, Russians owe unlimited obedience to Nicholas. So the imperial ideology has it. It's precisely the same ideology that we saw with, Paul, with uh, Nicholas's ancestor Paul in 1800. But of course, Andrew, if you, well, Nicholas II, I think, you know, is a very well-known figure. Um, a, rather, a rather gentle man in many respects, um, not, no, but not up, not up to um, ruling Russia. Not a, um, increasingly, Nicholas, Nicholas wanted to be this absolute monarch for Russia. He wanted to be this person taking all of the decisions. But of course, now we have this Russia of rapidly comp uh, uh, Russia that's diversifying, becoming ever more and more complex. How can one person possibly hope 
regard, no matter how talented. And Nicholas wasn't particularly talented. Rule this society alone. And this uh, picture of Nicholas and his wife dressed up as 17th century a nobles. Uh, Nicholas was a die-hard Russian nationalist, and he expressed this particularly in the sort of taste for uh, 17th, century, uh, 17th century clothing. Why the 17th century? Well, as you may know, Peter the Great in, 1700, in sort of the uh, uh, beginning of the 18th century westernizes Russia. So Russian nationalists regarded everything before, before Peter's rule was sort of authentically Russian. So this is why Nicholas loved to throw parties where he and his wife and his courtiers and the leading aristocrats would dress in 17th century forms of dress. Now, the empire that Nicholas finds himself ruling in 1894 has been radically challenged, geopolitically speaking. We saw at the end of the, uh, we saw in the last lecture how the empire had expanded eastward, westward, northward, and southward. Russia had been spectacularly successful in the 18th century in geopolitical terms. It had beaten most of its competitors. It had expanded its empire by a huge amount. In 1814, 1815, a Russian army sits in Paris, having defeated Napoleon. The Parisians are shocked as Central Asian horse riders go down the Champs Elysees. Oh, a brief story, by the way. Do you know Russians invented fast food? When the uh, soldiers of uh, Russia entered, the, entered Paris in 1814, 1815, and occupied it after defeating Napoleon. The officers, the Russian officers, went to the fashionable French restaurants to order food from the, uh, from the French chefs. And of course, being French chefs, they took their very long time to prepare their beautiful, exquisite dishes. And the Russian officers, increasing, you know, soldiers, increasingly impatient for their dinner, would shout out, bistre, bistre, quickly, quickly. And the French turned bistre into bistro, so that's where as a place for eating, uh, for a relatively quick serving of food. Anyway, a short story. But um, anyway, having accomplished this in 1815, this tremendous feat of basically arriving in the heart of Europe itself, in Paris, soon Russia's, um, Russia's armies begin to rapidly look old and antiquated. The Industrial Revolution in Britain is producing new forms of weaponry, new forms of tactics to accommodate that weaponry. Russia is still equipping its men, by the 1850s, Russia is still equipping its men with, with uh, Napoleonic era muskets. Whereas the British and French armies and other European armies are giving them the latest in fast firing rifles, in uh, the latest artillery, the latest mortars. And this weakness is stunningly exposed in the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. The Russians lose. And it is such a devastating loss because the fighting happens in, on Russian soil itself. The British and French land expeditionary armies in the Crimea. And they win. Alexander the, Nicholas, Nicholas I essentially dies from the shock of how badly the war was going and his son is forced to conclude a quick and humiliating peace with the European powers, Britain, France, France, Piedmont, and the Ottoman Empire. It is this defeat which drives Alexander to make his great reforms. He's aware Russia needs to be modernized if it's going to compete with its European great power adversaries. But it also seems to mark um, but there was no longer room for Russian, Russia to expand to the west, to the north, or to the south. The war was largely fought because Russia sought to expand into the disintegrating Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turkish Empire to the south. And so the east starts to look increasingly attractive to Russian emperors, to the Russian emperors and their statesmen. 
already in 1858, 1860, the first project of this eastward expansion was conducted. The Russians annexed the Amur region in the very far east of Siberia from the increasingly dilapidated empire of the Qing in China. Then in a 20 year period, Russia takes over the entirety of what today we call Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, a massive expansion. And Russia isn't done. It increasingly is looking at these territories around the Amur, increasingly showing ambition in areas like Korea and in China. China at the time was an, was an increasingly weakened state being di divided up by the other European powers and Russia did not want to lose out when it came time to dividing the Chinese, uh, the Chinese empire among the hungry European empires. By the way, here's a map just to give you an idea of the scale of those Central Asian conquests. Yes, mostly, uh, the, mostly, of course, the population of these, uh, of these areas are, are, Muslim, are Muslims, but also some Buddhists in Kazakhstan. And the Russian army has indeed changed as a consequence of modernization. We talked yesterday about how Russian, the Russian army was basically this sort of a almost punishment institution where it took, they, they essentially sent uh, unruly or otherwise unwanted peasants who had to serve for 20 years, most likely never emerging again from the army. Well, from 1871, 1872, with, the, with new reforms, the army is modernized. It comes to increasingly look like an army today. Conscription is made universal for all social classes in Russia in 1871, 1872. So young men have to go and serve in the army, I think, depending, on the, depending on when we're talking, two to three years and then become reservists. Of course, it doesn't, uh, universal, of course, the rich could usually pay their way out of service as ever. But generally, the idea is now, everyone is a subject to Russia and everyone should contribute to its defense in one way or the other. You fight, you support the soldiers, etc. And the army serves as a, serves some other purposes as well, universal conscription, means that when the soldiers come in, they can be taught, uh, particularly peasant soldiers, can be taught literacy. The, the new universal conscription is one reason why literacy rates are rising, because the army is teaching young peasant men how to read and write. Well, that army was put to the test, it's a fundamental test, uh, when Russia's Far Eastern ambitions were overreached. In the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, basically um, the Japanese made the first move launching a surprise attack, but this was preceded by simmering tensions between the Japanese and the Russians as both sides, both sides uh, eyed up territory in China and in Korea. And the result was a resounding Russian defeat an absolutely enormous humiliation. Why was it such enormous humiliation? Well, the way Russia looks at Japan at this period, say all the other European nations look at Japan at this period, is it's a barbaric Asian country, not like the civilized Europeans. And then this barbaric Asian country absolutely defeats a European great power. Russia is absolutely humiliated. And the defeat, the strains brought by the war, and the defeat in the war, of course, cause massive social disturbances in, in, the, main, in the main Russian core. So we're starting to see what the problems emerging at this point for the Russian, for the Russian Empire. Um, in the countryside, there's land hunger, poverty being caused by a shortage of land, resentment at the uh, continued um, predominance of the nobility in the countryside. In the cities, we confront a situation, a, a sort of a uh, boiling pot of 
um, poverty, of low pay, of very few workers' rights, combining with new radical ideas being promoted by socialist thinkers like Marx, among others, all contributing together to create and a series of failed modernization efforts which lead Russia, Russia's army into disaster against a perceived inferior opponent. Another problem for the Russian Empire that we have to discuss is the matter of nations and nationalism. So, you, at the beginning of the 19th century, in 1800, the idea of nation or national belonging or national identity was weakly developed, not just among Russians, but among most, among, among most peoples in, Western, in, in Europe. People tended to identify not by their nation, but rather by their locality, by their religion, by their social estate. But as increasingly, increasingly over the 19th century, the idea of the nation, of national identity, usually defined in linguistic terms, is, in, is um, Incre becoming increasingly prominent throughout the Russian Empire. In Poland, in particular, which before its partition at the end of the 18th century had had a long history of independent statehood, nationalism, in po Polish nationalism provoked two large-scale rebellions in Russian Poland in 1830, in 1830 and 1863. The rebellion, in, the rebellion in 1863 was particularly important because it deeply frightened the Russian state. Why did it frighten the Russian state? Just over the Polish border was the new German Empire, unified in 1871 by Bismarck, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia's two, two of Russia's biggest great power rivals. And if its border was in rebellion, its Polish border was in rebellion, but of course it made Russia vulnerable in a very vulnerable area, a, ver a very vulnerable in this particular area. And as nationalism spreads within Russia and in its uh, imperial borderlands, these borderlands start to demand things like more autonomy for their groups. So some start even demanding independence the, the, the periphery of the empire is beginning to try and pull away, to try and establish their own states, states which are supposed to act as guarantors and protectors of a particular national group. Now, the Russians sort of made their own bed with this by launching Russification. We talked last yesterday about what I called the empire of difference. We said, when the Russian Empire in the 18th century generally conquered an area, its general approach was to make a deal, a particular uh, deal, with the uh, people that it had conquered. If you are loyal to us, if you pay your taxes, if you send us soldiers, we will allow you to have your religion, to have your old laws, your, old, uh, your, your language will be the language of administration in your territory. Uh, your elites will maintain their privileges, their previous privileges and rights. And I said that the Russian Empire uh, is better to, in, by about 1800 was better conceived not as a single polity, but rather as a number of, de of special deals made between St. Petersburg and various areas that had been conquered. Now, this sort of empire of difference starts to crumble away by the end of the 19th century, particularly in the wake of the Polish rebellion. Because the Polish rebellion made the Russian, uh, Russian government and the Russian elites question the, vir the virtue of making these deals. For the Russian elite, the Polish rebellion had occurred precisely because um, Russia had not incorporated Poland truly into the empire. It had allowed all these privileges, autonomy, etc., uh, etc., et to the Poles. And Russian statesmen, increasingly themselves uh, influenced by Russian nationalist thought, start to demand the Russification 
of the peop of other peoples, the abolition of particular rights for languages for other religions, and the replacement on the replacement of these langu of uh, uh, of languages with Russian and the Orthodox Church. In the Baltic states, for instance, uh, and so that is to say, in um, Estonia and Latvia, um, when Russification arrives in the 1880s, the Russian government abolishes German as a language of administration and of law and of, educa uh, and of education and replaces it with Russian. Uh, the University of Tartu, then the University of Dorpat, um, so had to stop teaching in German as it had done previously and start teaching in Russian. In fact, Tartu's name changed. It was uh, from German Dorpat into the Russian Yurev. And of course, the state backed the spread of the Orthodox Church in the Baltic states and the increasing limitations and persecutions on the existing Lutheran religion. Um, I, uh, by the way, the picture here is, uh, this is Finlandia, the represent, uh, national representation of Finland. She's carrying a book that says Lex, Law, and it's being attacked by the two-headed eagle, the imperial symbol. Uh, imperial symbol. Reciprocation is going on across uh, the, 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 across the, um, the Russian borderlands. In Finland, the, uh, in Finland it's going on, in Poland it's going on, Lithuania, Bessarabia, um, in some part, in the Crimea, in some parts of Siberia. But of course, I mean, even at the time, people are being, um, statesmen, some people are, uh, some statesmen are saying, well, this strategy is not very pragmatic. We are alienating these otherwise loyal elites. The Baltic Germans, for instance, had done very well out of the empire by 1900, by the 1880s. They were an extremely loyal elite to the government. Numerous Baltic Germans had, been, had held the highest offices in the Russian states in the Russian states since 1721, and this assault on language and religion alienated these important elites. And it, then, then it is no shock then, when in 1905 the first Russian Revolution takes place, that a great deal of the worst violence. And the worst reactions happens in the peripheries, where it's a reaction against Russification. Do we have time to do the Jews? Yes. Alongside this problem, alongside nationalism, there was the question of what to do um, with Russia's Jews. Before the partition of Poland, in, uh, at the end of the 18th century, Russia had had very, very, very few uh, Jewish um, uh, um, inhabitants. Um, but with the conquest of Poland, it became the Europe's uh, single largest Jewish state, or rather the Jewish inhabitant, uh, it had the largest number of Jewish inhabitants of all European states after the annexation of the Polish territories. Um, the, Russian, um, the Russian government's approach to the Jews uh, in the empire was always um, extremely prejudicial and aimed at limiting Jewish freedoms uh, and movement to try and keep them in one place. Uh, this led to the establishment of what was called the Pale of Settlements. This was, uh, I do have a map actually, yes. A vast territory um, dominating the entirety of the eastern, of the uh, western borderland of the Russian Empire, the place where Jews were confined. Um, Generally speaking, there were occasionally there were relaxations in these policies, and of course, Jews themselves would migrate illegally, especially when as they seek 
uh, the new opportunities being offered by places like Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, to earn money in factories, etc., etc. Um, Russian universities could accept Jewish students, but these rights always tend to be limited after a while. So, for instance, um, after the in the 1870s, quota systems were established in universities, just saying that uh, universities could only take on a certain number of um, Jewish students in a year in order, therefore, to limit the amount of Jewish education. Um, let's just see if I need to say anything more about this. And in this Pale of Settlement, these multi-confessional, uh, multi-confessional, multi-ethnic, multilinguist, uh, multilingual uh, borderland, where alongside Russian Polish, Ukrainian, Yiddish, and a variety of other minority languages were spoken, where Catholicism, where alongside Orthodoxy one could find Judaism and Catholicism. Um, in this area, social tensions between the different groups were increasing, especially as nationalism and national identity stoked the tensions. And anti-Semitism in Russia was becoming a real problem. Violent anti-Semitism, I should say, is becoming a real problem by 1900. Pogroms, as they were called, violent attacks, violent long attacks on the Jewish population were becoming a regular occurrence in Russia, in Russia by 1900. After some truly awful events, for instance, in the Polish, in, in, in the Polish city, uh, in Kiev, uh, in, the 18, in the 1880s, and also, and also in the Bessarabian provinces in Kishinev. If you had asked um, a European observer in which country would uh, a genocide against the Jews take place in the 20th century, uh, they would have probably have said in Russia, because Russian policies at this point were renownedly, the Russian government was renownedly anti-Semitic. Nicholas II himself was quite severely anti-Semitic, and a great deal of both um, unofficial and official violence was being directed towards Jewish groups towards the end of the 19th century. And of course, um, this provoked mass Jewish migration away from Russia, particularly um, some going into, uh, into Central Europe, but mainly fleeing to uh, the United States of America. Um, while others sought a solution, those who stayed behind, many of them sought a solution to their um, lack of freedom, to their uh, to the repressive state, to the violence, uh, to the repressive measures taken against them, to the violence being taken against them, uh, they sought a solution in joining the burgeoning revolutionary movements in the cities, with groups like the uh, with uh, groups like the Bolsheviks uh, having large numbers of Jewish leaders and members. The, uh, but I just this is this, an interesting to note, by the way, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I don't know if any of you know this, of course, this horrendous text, which is still brought up today by anti-Semites to claim that Jews are operating a conspiracy to, uh, to rule the world and destroy Christian populations. Well, this text was actually um, written by a Russian secret agent uh, and published by a Russian secret agent. Um, it was a forgery, of course. There's no such thing as the Elders of Zion. All of these problems, then, that we are discussing, the problems of the peasantry, the problems of radical ideas, uh, of radical new ideas, the problems of urban poverty, the problems of the national peripheries breaking away, the defeats, uh, defeats in Crimea and then in the, Japanese, in the Russo Japanese War, the continued insistence of Nicholas that he was the absolute ruler of Russia and, no, and had the own, he had the sole right to rule Russia. All this was brewing together in this ever more mobile, ever expanding, new industrial modern society, leading to the revolution, the attempted revolution in 1905. Taking place in the final days of Russia's humiliating war against the Japanese workers, 
marched in massive numbers on the streets. They conducted strikes, shutting down key factories like the Putilov factory, producing armaments for the war. Initially led by the priest, Father uh, Georgi Gapon, a peaceful attempt um, was made to appeal to Nicholas II. Father Georgi led a crowd or uh, a, a, a large crowd, a large protest march through the streets of St. Petersburg to the gates of the Winter Palace. The crowd carried icons um, and, uh, bre and bread and salt for the traditional uh, Russian peasant's expression of hospitality and loyalty to the Winter Palace and presented a loyal manifesto to Nicholas II. While Nicholas II was not currently in residence at the Winter Palace, um, and in the lack of any kind of centralized command, the Cossack troops guarding the palace opened fire on the protesters, um, killing numerous. Still, we don't know precisely how many were killed, but a large number were killed and injured, and the crowds were driven from the streets by the Imperial soldiers. And this finally broke, it seems, the old peasant loyalty to the Tsar. There had been an old peasant idea. The Tsar himself is true and good, it's own, and it, on our side. The problem is he has corrupt advisors, always delaying or twisting or corrupting his orders and oppressing us. The slaughter in, on January, uh, the 9th of January 1905 finally seems to have broken through to the peasants that it was indeed the imperial regime itself that was responsible for their oppression and for their, um, and for their suffering. The results of the slaughter in January led to, incre uh, ma uh, led to a general strike across the empire with factories and industrial production grinding to a halt. In the provinces, um, nationalist groups, in the, uh, prefer in the preferies, nationalist groups demanding autonomy or even independence started launching violent attacks on police, uh, on police officers, state buildings, uh, army units, and so on and so forth. The situation was truly looking critical. Uh, in the countryside, especially, violence is widespread. The peasants, um, fueled by this resentment and this uh, resentment at the nobility and this desire for land, launched extremely violent assaults on the landowning aristocracy, burning down manor after manor, driving families out, in some cases killing uh, large numbers of, our, of any nobles or noble landowners that they could get their hands on. The situation truly looked critical for Nicholas. And so even he was finally he realized that he had to make some concessions. The first such concession was made in April 1905 when he issued the Edict of Religious Toleration, which expanded the rights, the religious rights of non-Orthodox minorities in the empire. The idea was that this would calm the situation in the largely non-Orthodox borderlands of the empire. And then finally, however, this did not seem to work. And so in October 1905, he released the October Manifesto, where he declared the creation of a state Duma, a parliament, and constitutional rights for Russian citizens. And he uses this word explicitly, citizen, not subject, citizen. These rights include things such as the freedom, um, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, and so on and so forth. So it generally looks then that a new age is dawning in 1905. A new age of a constitutional monarchy um, whereby the people finally take a, some kind of role 
in their government. Of course, as events were to prove in the next decade, this did not happen. But at this point, I think we're going to bring an end to our contextualization of Russian history, okay? I'm hoping that the last two lectures have given you an image precisely of the changes that are occurring in the Russian Empire. How from, 18, from the situation from 1800, from this stable, um, largely immobile empire, largely agrarian, largely non-industrialized, how this changes in 1900 into a empire of movement, an empire of industry, of industri uh, an empire that's being industrialized, modernized in every conceivable term, an empire where new ideas are flowing down in all social estates, but it's also an empire that is increasingly challenged from several deep, several deep rooted problems. Now, when we go into the rest of the course over the coming next few months, we're going to see precisely how orthodoxy as a church, the Orthodox Church, and as a religion react to this changing situation between 1700 and, 19, and 1917. How religious beliefs, practices are influenced by forces like industrialization, modernization. How religion is challenged and how religion reacts to ideas like those of Darwin and Karl Marx. How the church tries to, itself tries to modernize its institution, its clergy, um, and its, its theology and its practices to try and deal with some of the challenges emerging from places like the new cities or an increasingly literate peasant class. Okay, um, so any questions? Excellent. I'm very glad you understood, it, understood everything. I certainly didn't. Um, can everyone read the uh, slides okay, yes? Okay, okay. So I actually managed to finish earlier than I have at normal, which is a miracle for me, uh, unprecedented. So then if there are no questions, I suppose I'll let you go early for lunch. Thank you. No problem.